Gaming on Linux has always been a fascinating concept to me. Non-native applications running at native speed through various translation layers, all being nearly invisible to the end user. Well, if you buy into the developer's claims, Zorin OS might just scratch that itch, bundling Windows familiarity and compatibility into one neat Linux-flavored package. But does it actually work as advertised? Today's video is brought to you by craftcomputing.store, the letters I, P, and A, and viewers like you. Or at least it could be. If you like the things we do here on Craft Computing, consider joining the Patreon. Every contribution helps keep power onto my lights, my server rack, and my beer fridge. Seriously, I would not be able to do the things that I do without the amazing support from my patrons. As little as $1 a month gets you exclusive access to my Discord server, which my amazing patrons from all over the world keep lively at all hours of the day. You can chat with me or the other hosts from our weekly live show, Talking Heads, or simply lurk and catch the ebb and flow of the Craft Computing community. Visit patreon.com slash craftcomputing to sign up today. That's patreon.com slash craftcomputing. And again, thanks for watching. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Today we're going to be taking a look at Zorin OS, a Linux distribution that I've been aware of for at least the last couple years. Their goal is to create a desktop that's not only familiar to Windows or Mac OS users, but reaches feature parity with the big two operating systems in looks, features, and in the case of Windows, software compatibility. That's a pretty bold claim, but one that might not be the stretch that your gut just warned you about. For starters, Zorin is a Debian-based Linux operating system similar to Ubuntu or Pop! OS. But Zorin has a bit of a superpower. You see, while I've been using Pop! OS on my gaming PC for the last few months, as well as even going as far to take it to a LAN party, there's one feature I've always wanted to see included in the OS. That is the ability to run Windows applications through Wine just by double-clicking on them. For modern games, this really isn't the most needed feature, as pretty much everything we play these days comes in some form of launcher for both downloading and playing the games. Steam, Epic, even GOG has their own launcher. But when it comes to retro PC gaming or additional applications that you might want to run, there might just be something to this added functionality. Earlier this year, I went through more heartache than I'd care to talk about right now building a retro rocket PC. In fact, I hated it so much, I built it three different times, the final iteration of which you never got to see on camera. Now, it is still using the same aluminum ITX PC case, but now it's rocking an Intel Core i7-2600, an Asus Q67 ITX motherboard, 4GB of DDR3 1600MHz memory, a 500GB SATA SSD, and an NVIDIA GT740 for the win card from EVGA. While my original goal was to run Windows 98 or Windows Millennium for that true retro aesthetic, the hardware I was attempting to use just wound up being more trouble than it was worth. Upgrading to a much more modern set of hardware while retaining Windows XP support gave me kind of a best of both worlds scenario, with more than enough power to run any game prior to 2010 at ultra settings and compatibility with almost every game from Windows 95 and higher. But it's still not perfect. For starters, while there is a ton of horsepower in this PC, the drivers and APIs used in older gaming titles aren't necessarily supported in Windows XP. Things like 3D Effects and Glide for 3D rendering. And while there are wrappers to run these titles on direct 3D cards, compatibility is a bit hit or miss. So short of running a period correct 3D Effects card alongside Windows 98, how are you supposed to actually play titles like this? Surprisingly enough, Linux may hold all the answers. Installing Zorin should be very familiar to anyone who's installed Ubuntu before. Now, there are a number of different versions of Zorin, both free and paid tiers, but don't let that last part put you off from using it. I'll be using the Pro Lite version of Zorin, which simply includes a host of productivity software, along with a number of desktop layout options. So whatever OS you're most comfortable with, whether it be Mac OS, Windows 7 through 11, or even Ubuntu proper, there's a desktop layout that will make you feel right at home. The Lite version of Zorin simply means that as few background services as possible are running on the OS, making it a great choice for lower powered or older PC installations. Not that the PC that I'm using today is short on power with the Intel Skull Canyon Nook, complete with an Intel Core i7-8809G and AMD Vega 20 graphics. It's definitely overkill for a retro gaming PC, but it's also not outside the budget that I spent building three different versions of my retro rocket. 
Booting into the OS for the first time drops you onto the desktop and offers a tour of all the various features available in Zorin. And it's really not a bad place to start out if this is your first time with the OS. But for now, I'm only interested in the Windows compatibility features I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Clicking on the Start menu, you all know what I mean. If you go to the System menu inside of that, you'll find an option for Windows compatibility. Checking this, we'll go to the Zorin store where you'll install most of the packages you need to run Windows apps directly from your desktop. I say most because Mesa drivers, DXVK, Proton GE, and the like of modern compatibility packages are not included in this initial download. For those, you'll need to install through apt in the terminal. Installing Lutris through apt will also get you most of the necessary dependencies you might need for some games. I'm not gonna go through all of the commands right now, but I will have them linked down in the video description. The installation is pretty simple, and you'll just need to install the correct drivers for your graphics card, be it Intel, AMD, or Nvidia. A word of caution though, I did have some issues running with Intel integrated drivers, so your mileage is certainly going to vary there. The Windows layer is a combination of Wine and Play on Linux, and you'll want to start by launching Play on Linux and installing the most recent version of Wine, both x86 and x64. I know that sounds like recursion as I installed Wine to install Play on Linux, but trust me, this is a necessary step. Once all this is done, you're finally ready to install a game, and I've tested both GOG modern installers as well as original ISOs and CDs, and have had a fair amount of success either way. Though I will admit Zorin OS hasn't been perfect, nor is it ultimately the best option, as I'll explain shortly. We'll start with the good, as I know dozens of games that have issues running with 3D acceleration on modern DirectX cards. Probably most notably, Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight. Whether you purchase the game through Steam, GOG, or have the original 2 CD set, the game is notorious for not allowing hardware 3D acceleration in any operating system higher than Windows Millennium, regardless of what 3D hardware you have. Even though it's supposed to utilize Direct3D 5 and be forwards compatible with DirectX, it simply doesn't work. That is, until I installed it in Linux. Both on Pop! OS and in Zorin, I was able to get the game running at HD resolutions with hardware acceleration enabled. And while software rendering has always meant the game is playable in a modern OS, it also only allows for 8-bit colors and has very subpar lighting, making the game look far worse than it did when it was originally released. Now, Dark Forces 2 is far from the only game that suffers from this issue. A majority of Direct 3D 5 and 6 games flat out refuse to allow modern graphics cards to do their bidding. In fact, even through Wine, I was unable to get a couple of other titles working because they searched for specific versions of DirectX to be installed. DirectX 6.1 is probably the prime example. There are other games from that era that ran without a hitch though. Sim Theme Park, the entire Thief series of games, Elder Scrolls Morrowind and Oblivion, Star Trek Elite Force, Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed, Need for Speed Underground 2, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, and the list kind of goes on from there. But here's the big problem. All of those games were fully playable in Pop! OS and on Steam OS, but not in Zorin. At least not through the stupid simple point and click method that Zorin is trying to implement. Let me explain. You see, while Zorin has implemented Wine as a running service in the operating system, allowing Windows executables to run simply by double-clicking them, it seems that not all of the other services, translation layers, or file structures like to be called up to translate game APIs. Installing a game does create a Wine configuration file and a shortcut on your desktop, which allows you to simply double-click it to launch the game. But selecting a specific version of Wine, DXVK, or configuring specific workarounds needed by games seems to be a complete no-go at this time. For example, Thief and Hitman Blood Money ran just fine through the built-in Wine layer, but Dark Forces 2 still required me to install through Lutris and then launch that way to get the game to start, which pretty much defeats the purpose of Wine running as a system call at all. What's worse is other games that I've been able to run in Pop! OS were either broken in strange new ways or straight up refused to run at all in Zorin, despite having nearly identical packages installed. Need for Speed 3 Hot Pursuit had some bizarre graphical glitches when running in DirectX 8 mode and refused to launch at all using 3DFX acceleration, but it did run just fine through DirectX 7. 
Retro PC gaming is always a fascinating journey to embark on, especially the Windows 95 through XP era. As there were so many competing standards and hardware makers, sometimes the only winning move is to not play those games. Whether it's oddities in Direct 3D, hardware tie-ins for 3D effects and glide acceleration, or just general Windows hybrid 62-32-bit goofiness, it seems there really isn't a magic bullet for getting everything to run perfectly, even when you eliminate Windows from the equation. Now I know it sounds like I'm pretty down on Zorin OS here, but I really do like what they're attempting to do, as one of the biggest hurdles with Linux adoption and its use is always unfamiliarity with most users. Just because Windows binary compatibility isn't 100% up to the standards of Steam's Proton doesn't mean I'm not hyped about the possibilities here. Having a desktop environment that can switch between traditional layouts on the fly is an amazing feature, allowing users to be more comfortable in this strange new environment. And in theory, bringing over your Windows applications without the need for third-party launchers or virtualization sounds like a nearly perfect solution. But in this case, it is in need of some more polish before I can recommend using it. When it comes to more modern games, Zorin was pretty much on par with Pop! OS, which makes sense given their shared Debian architecture and package versioning. In fact, there's nothing stopping you from adding applications to Steam Play inside of Zorin to reach the same level of compatibility as other Linux distros enjoy. It's just the native double-click launcher hasn't quite reached that same level of success yet. While Proton is just a collection of Wine, DXVK, and some extra translation layers, it certainly proved itself as being capable of running just about any gaming application that comes its way. If I were on the Zorin dev team, I'd be seriously considering integrating Proton GE into their Wine package, and to take it a bit further, adding in Wine and Proton options into a context menu for easier customization and compatibility, as that seems like the next logical step forward for seamlessly running Windows applications. And personally, I can't wait to see if they're able to pull it off. As always, if you like this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Mastodon at Craft Computing at hostducks.social for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. I don't know that I want to finish that. Beer for today comes all the way from Shakopee, Minnesota. It is the Badger Hill Brewing Hazy IPA. And thanks to Novella Hub for sending this one over. New England style hazy clocking in at 6.1%. But as Rhett says, it's too bad that I hate hazies. That's got more body than Coors Light. So I, I don't need the full pint this morning. Wow. Yeah, look, I'm sharing. Huh. What drier than I was expecting. Yeah. What's funny is, um, I've talked about this before in reviews where you kind of prepare yourself for what what you're expecting. You you eat with your eyes and your nose first, and then you have a certain set of expectations when you actually go to taste something. Visually, this looks like a little bit of a cloudy, danker IPA. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm in with that, but it says hazy on the can, so I was gonna give that the, uh, the benefit of the doubt. I don't know why I set the can down. Uh, and... You go to smell it, and I'm getting like some honeydew melon as far as citrus goes. Uh, like if that's the predominant aroma that I'm getting. The flavor is anything but either of those things. I think the best way to explain this one is there's a little bit of that super dry citrus right up front that... And it's not orange, it's not pineapple. We're talking more like the, the honeydew melon, the something to that effect. Um, there's just that slight little right up front. And it instantly fades away to this very wide, very broad, not complex, single flavor hop. <laughs> um, and so 
if you're used to drinking hazy IPAs that are the, this constantly changing, uh, you know, circus wheel of, of uh, sorry, Ferris wheel of, of hop flavors, um, this is definitely not it. It's not an off-putting flavor at all. It's just not quite what I thought I was signing up for when I opened the can. And then it's gone like champagne. Just... <laughs> yeah. Interesting one to say the least. Yeah. It's getting maltier. It's turning into a bad Irish red. Now it's just bad. Like there was a... There was a warming period where I got kind of uh, that Irish red, you know, real good malty back to it. The end of this beer is just awful. So this beer has been slowly, slowly changing flavor over the entire course of this video. We're about what, 35 minutes in, something like that. Um, the beer is only warmed up by maybe 10 degrees. Like I pulled it out at 36, it's probably 46 right now. It's it's still cold, just not ice cold. Um, it started out as a moderately decent, although not complex at all, IPA. I wouldn't even call it a hazy IPA. It has none of the markers of a hazy. But the backing of it was very like, it was dry and left you kind of malty. It, it was a it was a malty finish instead of a hoppy finish. About midway through the beer, it started almost tasting like an Irish red. Like the malt had warmed up and kind of just kind of broadened the back end of the drink a little bit. But the front of it was still very just like one dimensional. And now that honeydew melon has been replaced with like celery, kale, and black licorice. Like that's how, how far south it's gone. And the malt that was on the back, which in my opinion was kind of the redeeming factor of this beer, it's just spinach at this point. Like, like it went from like this warm, bready, sourdough kind of finish to I just had a bad salad with no oil or ranch or dressing of any kind. I'm stuffing kale into my mouth and I'm hating every minute of it.